I'm Kay Wagner, I'm your moderator. I'm in the class of 70, 78, 78 and 86. Um, that privilege uh, was great and uh, one time I got a distinguished alumni award, that was great. But to be here and work with the Alumni Association and these gentlemen is really an honor of a lifetime for me. Uh, we are gonna talk about pandemics we're gonna talk about cancer, two really, really important topics for all of us for many very reason, good reasons. So the format will be this. Each speaker will give about a 15 to 20 minute slide presentation, which you will be able to see on the boards here. Then uh, we'll open it for Q&A for the first speaker. Um, I'll ask one or two questions, but you are, feel free to answer, ask questions as well. Make sure you get a microphone so we can hear and record what you ask. Be thinking about your questions as the speakers make their presentations so that we can get a good exchange going. Our first speaker will be Dr. Myron Cohen. Uh, Dr. Cohen is UNC's Jurgen Bate, em eminent professor of medicine, microbiology, immunology, and epidemiology. He serves as director of the UNC Division of Infectious Diseases, as well as the UNC Institute for Global Health and Infectious Disease and is Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Health. He received his BS from the University of Illinois, also a good school, <laughs> and his medical de degree from Rush following which he completed training in internal medicine at the University of Michigan and in infectious disease at Yale before coming to UNC in 1980. In 2008, he received the OMAX Gardner Award, which many of you will know is the highest honor at the University of North Carolina. And in 2013, he received the Award for Science from the state of North Carolina. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Coyne was appointed to the Leadership Committee of the NIH COVID Prevention Network. And it's about that he will talk today. He will talk about living with pandemics, HIV, SARS, COVID-19, and what's next. Dr. Cohen. Uh, good afternoon. Well, you know, it's always tough to, like they say, it's tough to follow a children, it's tough, tough, tough to follow basketball speakers in this, you know, <laughs> Shelly and I are really not really prepared psychologically for this. Um, I guess the other point is for if you're an academic, we've spent the last two years, and I think I'm speaking for both of us, on Zoom with lots and lots of Zoom courses. And there's this idea that the species is uncomfortable, that we're not together. Let me tell you, that's probably not true. This is the first time I've worn pants giving a lecture in, 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 in two years. And, I have to, and then I have to look at other members of the species who are bored and doing Wordle and you know, whatever. You know, it's so much easier on Zoom when you think everyone's listening, you know, everyone's happy. So uh, I, thank you for letting me talk to you today in person. Uh, it's an honor, but it's scary, it's intimidating. <laughs> um, I'm gonna just divide this into two parts and it's gonna be really quick. And I'll answer questions, because I'm pretty sure you'll have questions on the part of the second part. The first thing I'm gonna do is just a little bit of bragging. I saw Shelly's slides, I wasn't gonna do this, but Shelly <laughs> runs a cancer center for about 100 years, has a lot to brag about, and uh, it's a wonderful cancer center. So I had to throw in a couple of slides about our infectious disease community, and then I'm gonna talk about content. I talk pretty fast, I'll slow down when something actually means something. <laughs> so, so, so first let me point out to you that, that this is one of the great global universities in the world, that we're ranked about 20th in the world as a global university. And a lot of it depends on our work both in cancer and in infectious disease. For my group, we work in, in Asia, Africa, <coughs> and Central and South America. We have probably about 1,000 employees outside the United States. And we try to make, we try and contribute in public health and medicine, uh, make discoveries that we think are important to the species. So these, this is just a, a bragging map just showing the places we work on the world. Our flagship site is in, in a country in Africa called Malawi where we've worked for 30 years. Uh, we've also worked in, in China for more than 30 years, almost 40 years. This is a bragging slide, I know it may not be easy to read, but if you look at the metrics, because and the metrics are the bragging part, um, we have 572 active infectious disease projects. We have about $100 million a year of research funding, which is about 10% of the entire university's research budget. Because of COVID, and I'll explain this later, 
in 2021, I had the most money in the United States. I personally <laughs> had the most money in the United States, which was a lot of money in 2021. It's all gone now. Um, we published 440 papers uh, in the last two years. We're ranked one to three. Um, in, 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 we're ranked for coronavirus research as number one in the country. Um, and we're ranked one to five to 10 in all other areas of infectious disease. So we have, a, and this is not about me, this is about the hundreds of people who work in this area. It's a really good university for people interested in infectious disease. Enough about bragging. So infectious diseases, let's sort of content. Infectious diseases are scary. People don't want to get infections. All of you have masks with you, that's appropriate. Under the right conditions, you're, you've been using them and wearing them, we'll talk about that later. Uh, they're scary and they generate a lot of movies. The movie Outbreak, Rene Rousseau's finest film with Dustin Hoffman where they saved the species. If you remember that movie, the monkey got out. We were all gonna die, but we were saved by Dustin Hoffman. Contagion more recently. And those movies, they play on what is not an unreasonable fear of infectious diseases. And this is a very age old fear, very, very deep in your brain. Um, now, and a lot of countries a lot, of, a lot of movies about zombies that started out with an infectious disease. And the one thing I can assure you is there is no zombie coming from any virus. The, the, the zombie movies are not true. <laughs> There's infectious diseases are unlike heart disease. And we make, kind of make fun, like say, well, why be a specialist as an ophthalmologist? There's two eyes. Or why be a nephrologist? There's two kidneys. In, infectious diseases are constantly changing. None of you expected to live the last two years of COVID, and none of you know what's next, right? This is just a list from 1980 on of infectious diseases that have caused worldwide concern, and we'll deal with coronavirus in more detail in a couple of minutes. So what are the human responses? Our human responses are not always rational. There's a vitamin at the airport, so you're gonna buy airborne before you get on a plane, and somehow magically, you're gonna think that taking this vitamin is gonna prevent you from getting something that's gonna kill you on the airplane. That's just not possible. And then there's this whole thing, toilet seats. I've never, I've been doing infectious diseases for 40 years, and I understand all the plastic and toilet seats going around in circles. First of all, you don't know if it's ever this changing plastic. How do you know it's not the same? Did, did anybody ever go behind the wall to see but that's not the same plastic going around? Second, 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 has anyone ever met a person who got an infection in a toilet seat? Never. So we have this kind of irrational behavior that we have to understand because deep in our brains are our fear of infectious diseases. So what do we do when we confront an infectious disease? This is like firemen have to run into the fire. We don't have a choice. You choose this specialty, you have to do your work. First, most important thing to us is know the rules. All infectious disease have rules. When we see a new infection, we say, what rules are governing it? There's gonna be rules to, that govern how we might prevent it. There's gonna be rules that govern how we're gonna treat it. And there's gonna be rules how we're gonna cure it. Now, this is our universe. And there's three parts of our universe. We live in a microbial sea. None of you are, unless you went into an autoclave today, none of you are sterile. You are so covered with microorganisms they're uncountable in number. And, I, and that's not to scare you. We just live in a microbial world. Most of these things don't make us sick. Only very few of these organisms make us sick. You are the host for these organisms. We call you the host. Most hosts are healthy in our species, and all, all of us are alive in this room, but we have a disadvantage. We age, and aging really compromises us. And as we age, we become more, more, and all of us, except for him, he's older, all of us are in the same room, you know, all of us are about the same age. And, and as we age, we become more vulnerable. And, and I'm telling you this now as a, as a forewarning, that the number one risk factor for doing bad with COVID is age. Oh. Everything else falls apart, age, age, age. And with the latest uh, variant called Omicron, Age 76 is a really critical age. So if you're under 76, go out and have a party. If you're 76, rethink your night. Um, and then the, the, third thing, the third thing is environment. Environment um, defines the risk. And for us, environment is everything. What's your sex life? What do you do for a living? Where do you work? We look at the environment as broadly as you can possibly use the word environment. And then we, we talk about how diseases are transmitted. There is human to human transmission, which we'll come back to, animal to human, insect to human, and environment to human. Most people we see have uh, cut themselves and got an infection from a cut. That's just environment to human. Insect to human is malaria, dengue, Zika. Those are big deals, but it's hard to sustain an epidemic with, with insect to human at the, at the level of uh, human to human transmission. What we fear and what's 
What's caused us so much grief is the human-to-human -human transmission of HIV and SARS-CoV-2. So when we <clears throat> talk about the rules, we, we worry about efficiency. How easy is it from a for a bug to go from one person to another? If the bug can't get to the next person, if it's inefficient, who cares? How durable is the infection? If the infection is, kills the person right away, they can't infect anybody else. But if the person stays sick for months and months and months, you can infect somebody else. And lastly, we worry about the number of people that can be exposed. Um, for sexually transmitted diseases, for most of us, it's pretty hard to have more than one person exposed. But for respiratory diseases, it's easy to expose a lot of people all at the same time. So these are all about the rules. HIV, what are the rules for HIV? So most of us in infectious diseases have spent a lifetime working on HIV. And I know that's not on the top of your list, but it's killed 36 million people. So, and it has been the pandemic before SARS-CoV-2 of our, of our lifetimes. And we know how it's transmitted. We know all the rules. We know it remains contagious for life. And that's the problem because the host can keep infecting other people if, if we don't recognize the infection. And we know it's a volitional infection. It takes human behavior for the bug to go from one person to another. Whereas COVID is not volitional, right? Anybody can give anybody else COVID. So we have volitional diseases and non-volitional diseases. One, this slide I throw in, this is a bragging slide, Shelley, so let me apologize. In, in 2000, so in order to prevent, we try, we've been trying to make an HIV vaccine for 40 years. Guess what? We don't have one. So um, my work was focused more on trying to prevent HIV infection to the next person by treating the infected person. This is called treatment as prevention. And in a series of and, and investigators here, many, the dean of our school of public health, of our school of pharmacy, Angela Kajuba, has been my partner the whole time on this work. She and I and many others were able to show that when we treat somebody with HIV infection, we render them no longer contagious. This observation, and, and in truth, it changed all recommendations about HIV worldwide. And in 2011, it was recognized as the science breakthrough of the year. The then editor of science said this has changed the world. And the most important thing is that this is my most expensive slide, if I can make it. The guy's mouth moves. I don't know if I can show you that. I can't go backwards. But the guy's mouth moves. It took me a year to make the guy's mouth say that. <laughs> can I go backwards? The red, well, let's see if we can make his, but uh, his mouth. Sorry, it's just your defective clicker. Okay. All right, we're gonna, <laughs> we're, it's not my fault. We're gonna move on to SARS coronavirus. So here we have coronaviruses. They're common viruses. They cause the common cold. You've all had dozens of coronaviruses, a runny nose, a sneeze, who cared? Then in, uh, I guess it was around, nine, I forget the exact year, there was SARS-CoV-1. SARS-CoV-1 was a disastrous disease in Canada and in China, and it, yeah, all of you had your temperatures taken at airports, and we did all kinds of things, but we, we could control SARS-CoV-1. Now, who knows why we were able to control SARS-CoV-1? Shelley, there's, a, there's one reason. It wasn't as a virus. Uh, we're not sure about that. There's another reason. So, good guess. I'm going to give him credit. But the, the reason why is because it was primarily transmitted by symptomatic people. So we, when we took, if you were asymptomatic, you were not a transmitter. So once we realized we, the rules, the rules, once we saw it was only transmitted from symptomatic people, we took everybody's temperature. We isolated people. We had one case in Chapel Hill. We built a big tent. Uh, we, we had a big deal in Chapel Hill for one case of SARS-CoV-2, but we controlled it and it went away. But this was a big warning to us. And SARS-CoV-1 was a big warning. And then we had another SARS called MERS SARS. That was going from camels to humans to humans. But because it mostly went from camels to humans, and there's very few camels in Chapel Hill, this was really not much of a worry for us. You know, you'd have to go to Saudi Arabia to worry about SARS COVID, SARS, MERS SARS. But one of our investigators, Ralph Barrick, who's a coronavirus expert, he devoted himself to MERS SARS. That became very important for what happened next. So Ralph is a distinguished scientist, just, just got into the National Academy of Science, which is the pr most prestigious honor you can have, in the, short of the Lasker Award, the Nobel Prize, and Ralph was elected to that. And so then we got SARS-CoV-2. So now we have SARS-CoV-2. It's killed a million people in the United States. So it's, it, if you hear on the news, it's not a big deal. It's a benign disease. That's not true. A lot of people have died from this disease. Um, mostly related to age and underlying comorbidities, but especially age. Now, worldwide, the death 
toll from SARS-CoV-2 is believed to be unbelievably underestimated. So WHO just came out with recommend no, uh, statements indicating that we probably have the number of deaths in many countries. The United States is probably, probably closer to a million five people dead from SARS-CoV-2 than a million. Okay, so I've told you how this works. We have a brand new disease. We get, and this is now December of 2019. We have a brand new disease. It's a coronavirus. We're told to understand the rules. This became pretty simple to us. There's a lot of gobbledygook. There's Purell all over the place. You know, there's, there's don't touch the elevator buttons. All of that is senseless. This is a disease that goes from one person's nose to another person's nose. It's very straightforward. It goes from the nose to the nose. Eskimos have a disadvantage, I guess. <laughs> but, but the point is, the point is that the virus will replicate in your nose after transmission, and you're in a race to eliminate it from your nose with your own host defenses, your own antibodies. If you don't eliminate it from your nose, it keeps growing, falls into your lungs. When it falls into your lungs, you get pneumonia, and you get blood clots, and some people will die. The people who get pneumonia and blood clots are older people. And uh, college students, which we were very afraid of, they tolerate this infection for the most part, no problem. <clears throat> My colleague and I, Larry Corey, in the very beginning of this, were asked to publish an editorial in Science, which we did, pointing out that this is for us, just like HIV, know the rules and do three things. Prevent it, treat it, and, and, and get rid of it. Cure, in this case, means long COVID, because about 20% of people, 30% of people who get COVID lose their taste, lose their smell, keep coughing for long periods of time. Mass are really critical. And now we've given up a lot of masking because we're so tired of it, but it doesn't mean they're any less critical. And we've given, I'll come back to that if, if we want to. I, I endorse masks completely. Omicron is not so aggressive, so we're tolerating these infections better and we have more treatments than we had when we had alpha. But with alpha, masks became critical. People have been fighting about, this is the great flu epidemic, people were fighting about masks then. So it's not a new idea. The one thing we learned about masks is they completely block influenza, actually. So we had no flu last year. So, so masks are the best flu vaccine ever developed. All right, so what happened? So then it's a day like any other day, and my colleague Larry Corey and I and two other people are called by the NIH and said, and there's HHS, is the Federal Government's Health and Human Services, the NIH you're all familiar with, um, and then we're asked to start a whole new program, a COVID prevention program for the United States. So four of us then are given the money to develop vaccines and other ways to prevent COVID. And, and that was, the government spent on COVID $25 billion two year, in the last two years, $25 billion. So I'm gonna show you in two slides the product of $25 billion. Product one, vaccines. So there are three kinds of platforms for vaccines. One platform is like the vaccines you've always taken, called protein vaccines. All of you have had protein vaccines. The, all the vaccines you've taken, they work. And they have a really big advantage, which I'll get to if you ever have time. The second kind of vaccine that was being developed was called an adenoviral vectored vaccine. It's a virus that gives you the vaccine. The problem with that vaccine is it can cause blood clots. And the FDA just yesterday severely restricted the one adenovirus vaccine in the United States and told people not to take it. So let's forget about that. The third vaccine was magical, called the mRNA vaccines. It makes, it, it, it is a strategy to allow a protein to be made speedily so that that protein, and, and to make the vaccine speedily, and those mRNA vaccines, what everybody in this room I'm sure has gotten, either the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine. Those are the two vaccines in the United States. They work, you've all taken one shot, two shots, three shots, four shots, Physicians have all taken four shots. I'm looking at my friend. But the good news is they've provided you with some protection. But the protection we're seeing from these is not durable, and you're not done. And I'm forewarning you that we're going to give a whole other vaccine in the fall. Okay, so the vaccine you received is not enough. We're going to tell you we want to give you another vaccine in the fall, just a forewarning. And that vaccine that we're making now is much more devoted to Omicron than our older vaccines, because Omicron is our current virus. The other thing that we've done that's really important is we've unleashed a thing called a monoclonal antibody because we can make these really quickly. And so these monoclonal antibodies can be given to people who can't respond to vaccines. They can be given to people as a treatment. They go to your nose immediately. And so what are we doing? We're putting this antibody in your nose so that when the virus shows up, the antibody is already there. Or now you've got COVID. So we'll put that antibody in your nose as quickly as we can to stop the, and we put it through your veins into your nose. We don't shove it in your nose. We, we give it IV or an IM injection, and it prevent, and it, it 
helps you win the race against COVID. That's what we're doing. We're speeding up your ability to get SARS-CoV-2 out of your nose. So when we look at now, so for prevention, we're gonna give a lot of people monoclonal antibodies who can't respond to vaccines. We're gonna give everybody else on the planet we can vaccines, and we're gonna make better and better vaccines. And we're gonna make better mRNA vaccines because we already know some of the problems. That's all gonna happen with your tax dollars. With respect to the disease itself, there's asymptomatic. I've already told you, asymptomatic transmission is the problem. More than half of the transmissions are from somebody who doesn't know they have SARS-CoV-2 infection. Then there's mild to moderate disease. You're coughing, you're sneezing, you don't feel well. And then there's severe disease. You're in the hospital, you're in the ICU, you're intubated, and you don't survive. What we're trying to do is push everything to the left. We're going to treat you, so we're going to change how we manage respiratory infections. Now you get a cold and you say, okay, I got a cold, I'm going to ignore it. Five years from now, you're going to get a cold and you're going to go to an urgent care center. They're going to test you and tell you whether, not five years from now, two years from now. They'll say you have COVID, you have RSV, you have influenza, or you have other. And if you have any of the first three, they're, we're going to treat you. We're going to change how we manage respiratory infections worldwide. And that's already happening. So here's the treatments that are available today. We can use for pre-exposure prophylaxis vaccines or some monoclonal antibodies. We can use, if you're in a household, we can do post-exposure prophylaxis to try and prevent you from getting this from somebody in your household. And if you get SARS-CoV-2, of the list of drugs, two survive. One drug, three survive. One is a drug called Paxlovid, which we gave 80,000 prescriptions last month of this stuff, and its use is growing and growing. Plenty is at the pharmacy right now, so we're giving lots of Paxlovid. It's a five-day course. Uh, we're giving monoclonal antibodies to people who cannot take Paxlovid, a monoclonal antibody called Bebtilivimab, and then we're making new drugs. And there's a lot of new drugs, just like in any other, just like antibiotics 30 years ago, we're making a lot of new drugs. This is where we are. So in summary, I, and I, I, I apologize, Shelley, if I went a minute too long. It wasn't that long. Uh, humans suffer from infectious diseases, know the rules, and our technologies let us win the battle against microbial pathogens, foes, but it's hard. It's time consuming, and I thank you all for listening to this. Thank you. Open it to answer questions that you may have. Um, have well, and we I, do I, need y'all to use the microphone. I, I have a suggestion, to be fair. I suspect oh, there's a lot of SARS-CoV-2 questions. I know that. I mean, a lot. I, I can't. My, my cell phone right now is filled with questions. I suggest we let Shelley speak and then answer it once because I'm a little worried about, like, I don't want to get into answering a, a zillion questions. We're okay. We're going to do a five minutes. All right. But li li limit, because, I, I, yes, it's a scary disease. <laughs> Okay, who has a question? Okay. Yes, let's get your microphone. Sorry, Dave. Yeah, I just don't want to step on so What Was COVID-19 manufactured in a laboratory? Uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I know it is. <laughs> no, there, there, there's people have tried to really look at this as carefully as possible with our technologies, right, without dismissing any, any opinions. There's no doubt that the first cases we saw in Wuhan, there's no doubt there's a big coronavirus lab in Wuhan. What's been impossible to demonstrate is that the first virus we have, the ancestral virus, has footprints of what a human could do to the virus. If those footprints were there, and the, the, I can be more specific, the footprints are just missing. So people are open-minded to keep investigating and investigating with not accusatorily saying, well, maybe this was a lab accident, because it seems, look at outbreak and contagion. That's where it happened, but we can't find footprints. So all I can say is without the footprints, it's just a hypothesis. I mean, I'm open to it. F show me the footprints. I'm personally open. Okay, there's a question right back there, and the gentleman with a hat. Yes, sir. Hat. Uh, could you comment on the new, uh, yesterday I read that there's a new variant that uh, seems to be emerging. I don't remember the name of yeah, it. Could you well, comment okay. on that? Right, okay, so the variants. So, so the virus is going to do whatever the virus wants to do. It doesn't care what we say. It doesn't care what any politician says. It will do what it's going to do. We have to try and stay ahead of it. We've seen it emerge from alpha to beta to delta to Omicron. And within Omicron, we now have what's called beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and now beta 4 and beta 5. There are five Omicron variants. And each one has different rules, okay? Each one is following slightly different rules. 
they're, they're transmitted with different efficiencies. Alpha was not nearly as efficient as Omicron, because this virus wants to go from one person to another. But as Omicron has emerged, it's, it's turned out not to be as virulent. That is, it doesn't take away your taste and smell. It tends to kill somewhat fewer people. So the variants you're talking about are in the beta family, generally, That's the, and four and five have just been reported from Johannesburg, South Africa, where we have a site. The other thing that's going on is what are called recombinants, okay? Two coronaviruses can meet, fall in love, and, and, and mate. And when that happens, we, force, we face recombinants. We're very good at sequencing. Our labs here sequence these every day. We know exactly what's occurring in North Carolina. We have a program to survey the whole state. We know what's happening in the hospital. But I think you're reading about beta 4 and Omicron B45 would be the, the newest variants. Yes. Good. I have two very easy questions. Uh, what role does exercise play in mitigating the risk of a coronavirus or any kind of infectious disease? And if you're over 76, as I am, what specifically can you do other than go live in a cave <laughs> for exposure? Yeah, I mean, it's, it has it been a very difficult, those are, exercise is good no matter what, okay? There's, there, you can never go wrong with exercise because it can only boost your host defenses. Remember, what we want is your antibodies to form as fast as possible to eradicate the virus from the nose. These college kids, they're getting rid of their virus from their nose in a few hours or days. Older people are taking more time. The velocity of elimination of the virus is longer. The longer the virus is allowed to replicate, the worse. People who don't have B cells, we can't get rid of the virus. They will keep replicating, replicating, replicating. Now, your question about being 76, great age, congratulations. You know. 78, even a better age, you look like 40. Um, so, so my comment is, number one, get all four shots. You're not gonna hurt yourself with four shots. Number two, if you are receiving any sort of chemotherapy, something that would really compromise you further, get a, a shot in your arm called Evusheld, okay? It's an antibody that lasts six months. So we're, because we don't know who's gonna respond to vaccines. We're making more and more Evusheld. It has no side effects, basically it's free because the government's paying for it, and it's a really great drug. That's number two. Number three, be prepared. If you get sick, the first day you're sick, and I promise you my cell phone has somebody sick right now. The first day you're sick, call your doctor and say, I, I need to know if I have SARS-CoV-2. I need to know if I have this infection. You can swab your nose with a Binax now or one of those rapid tests. If it's positive, it's positive. If it's negative, you could still have this infection. Once you know you have the infection, say, I want to be treated right now, today. It, with, uh, waiting seven days is disastrous. You want, and we're going to treat you with this drug Paxlovid because we're going to use that drug to reduce the virus in your nose before it falls into your lungs. Those are the three things you can do. And fourth, you can wear masks in situations that seem to you particularly risky, if you will. I mean, masks work. I, 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 in, uh, they're stigmatized at some level in some parts of the country. I endorse people wearing masks. It's hard to give a lecture with a mask. It's hard to live on a plane with a mask. Masks are a great idea. When you find yourself in a crowded condition, I was in, in the American Airlines lounge yesterday, which was like a scariest experience of my life. You know, there are people like crawling the walls, like, you know, and I was wearing a mask the whole time because I just could not see but that you were gonna get COVID in that lounge. Those are the four things, thanks. Is there one more question? Yes, thank you. And follow up to that previous, your last answer about nose to nose spread and amongst Eskimos and others, uh, as I'm, well as. I'm not opposed to Eskimos. No. I, I, I'm going to get a call <laughs> saying you don't like Eskimos. No, 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 no. I'm just using it as a metaphor. And the last bullet on your last slide about um, research ongoing 24 7 about therapeutics and preventives. Could you comment quickly, maybe, on the work on intranasal vaccines and therapeutics? as a nasal spray, perhaps. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, I think a, a very hot topic is could we topically, since we know that this is so much dependent on a particular receptor in your nose called the ACE2 receptor, could we simply give you a nasal spray and block that? Or could we put an immunogen in your nose and make you make a molecule called IgA to block your ability to acquire the virus? Great research questions. People are working on it with, a lot of monkeys are giving their nose right now. Uh, a lot of macaques are giving up their noses to, to the research you're suggesting. The other point is we're trying to make a lot more drugs. And some of those drugs we might try and deliver topically. Although we don't have a lot of experience succeeding in that space. But, but the nasal vaccines exist already for influenza. They can, they can stimulate uh, production of local antibodies. So great question. Okay, could we get one more question in? Um, 
Oi, a quick one. Uh, okay. thank, thank you. I just have a really quick question. I am encountering more and more people that are back, double vaccinated, double boosted, and yet they're still, and I know the prevalence of these new variants. How is it that yeah, yeah. the exposed variants, that within one family, the father had the COVID and his two little girls, only one of the girls caught COVID. So, oh, uh, go slow, okay. So yeah. it's a really great question. <laughs> yeah. So, but you had about ten questions in that one space. So let, <laughs> let me let me just let me just comment I on this. Guilty. <laughs> the vaccine that we have, the four doses you took now, they're not designed to prevent you from getting infection. Uh, this is the bad news I'm going to tell you. They're designed to prevent you from being hospitalized and dying. Okay, we were forced to make a decision, and I, I'm part of this decision. We were forced, in a variety of ways, not to make a preventive vaccine, to make a don't go to the hospital vaccine. And that's what that vaccine is supposed to do. We're trying now to understand how to make a preventive vaccine. That drug, Evusheld, I talk about, that's to prevent infection. But we don't know how to do that in a vaccine yet. That's the first point. The second, so it's not, it's not surprising the vaccine fails. But when it fails, people should not become as sick. That's the point. They should not die. That was always our goal. Number two, in family spread, is almost impossible to stop. When one person is discovered, other people are already infected in the family, and those who you think are negative might only be negative on the day that test was done. And so it's very dynamic, but at least 60% of people, so we've done a lot of household studies, and we've shown a lot of things in households um, in our work. And it's just very difficult that you cannot isolate yourself properly in a household. <clears throat> Fortunately, children do very well, young people do very well, and the key, my friend, my 78-year-old friend, the key thing is, interrupt progression of disease. If you're older and at risk, don't let disease progress. Be aggressive, be an advocate for yourself. And people have trouble. Healthcare providers generally are not that familiar with this, okay? So healthcare providers don't know that CVS has Paxlovid. And so, and the patient doesn't realize they should go do a Binax Now test or a PCR test. And so we, education is a really part of getting out of this. So but thank you for the question. Well, thank you, everybody, for your question. We do need to go on, but after we're finished with this, if you have another question, I'm sure uh, Dr. Cohen will try to answer it for you. So let's get uh, a round of applause for Dr. Cohen. So our second speaker is uh, equally as exciting. Uh, Dr. H. Shelley Earp is a distinguished Langberger Professor of Cancer Research. He's director of UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Care Center and the UNC Cancer Care Center. He has, he earned his degree, uh, his bachelor's from Johns Hopkins, again, that's okay. His medical degree was from UNC. And he completed internship at Vanderbilt before joining the Army as a captain in the medical corps. He returned to UNC in the 70s to complete a residency and a fellowship. He too has received many honors. Um, he has received the Faculty Service Award in 2009, 2015, the UNC Distinguished Service Award. In 2017, he was named the Hyman L. Battle Distinguished Cancer Award awardee. He's chaired numerous national committees, and he's been the president of the American Association of Cancer Institutes. And he has a lab at UNC, and he's been funded for over 40 years by the NIH to find new drugs for a variety of cancer types. His title today is How UNC Lineberger Tops, Turns Top-Notch Science with, into Cancer Therapy Advances. Dr. So a couple things about my CV. I came here in 1966. Dean Smith never won a championship until I got here. <laughs> In 1968, I traveled to Cole Fieldhouse. I was there when Charlie Scott hit the shot that beat Davidson. I didn't join the Army. I was drafted. <laughs> Mike and I are not competitive. I'm a little older than he is. We have the same hairdresser, and he keeps pushing her. <laughs> He keeps asking her every time he goes, are you dying Shelley's hair? Yes. <laughs> that hair is not his hair. This is... um, if you take away one thing, we'll talk about cancer. I'll try to do it quickly because uh, it's, it's actually got a lot of diseases. The 
what Mike and I have grown up through is an ability, we're passionate about doing science, but the technology has changed everything. So what happened during this last two years of COVID was built upon years of infectious disease and cancer research because monoclonal antibodies and all of these things actually come together. And what you should be really proud of is the place that you graduated from is really good at this. We have $1 billion worth of research here. There's more in cancer than infectious disease. <laughs> However, it all does fit together. And Mike and I have actually been asked by our dean to come up with a grand plan to bring these things together. And this place is really good. So let me tell you about the Cancer Center. Um, first, the Cancer Center is a school of medicine entity but I work with 40 different departments across the university, and the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. It's not just the medical school, school of public health, school of pharmacy, school of nursing, dental school, chemistry, physics, psychology, neuroscience, all of those things are involved in cancer research coming together. Now, our cancer center is very highly rated. We, we get reviewed in a, kind of a different way by the National Cancer Institute, and we've been given the top rating 2010, 2015, 2020. So we are exceptional by their way. Because we do across the board, we do fundamental research of the type that we just talked about. We are excellent clinically. We take wonderful care of people, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But one of the things that's really important about us is that we are the state's cancer center and the state's cancer hospital. We take care of people regardless of their ability to pay. And that has grown dramatically. When we built our new cancer hospital, thanks to the state, thanks to Mark Bass Knight uh, and, and the legislature at the time, we were seeing about 3,000 new cancer cases a year. We're going to see 12,000 new patients this year through our medical center. That's a, about a fifth of all the cancers in the state of North Carolina. So we touch people from all 100 counties. We have incredible membership. We have about 450 members of the Cancer Center across the entire university. And our job at the Cancer Center is to bring them together. They don't naturally you know, relate to each other. We try to scour the countryside uh, and actually bring people together. We have national leaders that are uh, you know, all, all over the country the like Mike, who's uh, obviously a national leader for the work that he's doing. Uh, 6,500 publications over the last five years and $225 million <laughs> worth of cancer-related <laughs> research. Um, this is the heart and soul. Funding is great, but it's imperative that we take excellent care of patients. And the way you do that is to have all the oncologists get together, not make the patient go to six different visits, but to bring the patient in the center and have the medical, surgical, GYN, pediatric, pathology, uh, your radiation oncologist put together a plan and then carry that out. We treat about 6,500 to 7,000 of those 12,000 patients. The other 5,000 we are helping to plan and sending them out closer to home. We do have patients that come from 100 miles away or 150 miles away because we are the state's hospital. Um, and we, we love that, but we can't take care of everybody just for space. And by the way, if you notice, we don't have good parking. <laughs> so Ned Sharpless uh, is a wonderful junior faculty member that I had the privilege of recruiting. Uh, and Ned came here developed a spectacular career as a cancer doctor and cancer scientist. Um, he got so good, he took my job. Uh, and unfortunately, after about three and a half years, the nation came after him, and he was appointed the National Cancer Institute director of the entire nation. But this quote from Ned I love, uh, and I won't read the whole thing, but I'll give you the gist. He was a Moorhead scholar here as an undergraduate. He went to the medical school here went to Harvard for training and learned a lot about wonderful science. But when he came back, he made this statement that 
He loved Harvard. He loved the people that he was with. But being here was different because he could take care of patients at the top level regardless of their ability to pay. This was the state's hospital, and he wanted to make that better. This just shows you the reach. The black dots on the top one are patients that we see from all 100 counties. On the right and left below are patients from 85 counties and you know, actually research projects that we have all across the state. So we not only take care of patients, we do clinical trials that involve patients, and we particularly are interested in prevention and early detection across the state, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We invest in a cancer support program. Um, we have one of the best, uh, you know, one of the most wonderful people I know is a psychiatrist named Don Rosenstein, who has developed a comprehensive cancer support program. Cancer is scary. SARS-CoV-2 is scary. But people have been ingrained for literally since they were children that if you get a cancer diagnosis, it's bad. We are so much better. Some of that is lagging because we are really doing well with cancer. We are curing more people. We're preventing cancer more. But we see a preponderance of advanced disease here because people want to come to the, um, you know, to the Mecca and see the experts. So we deal with families that are, are at end stage. Don does an amazing job. We try to take our science and directly put it into patient care. Um, there's new immunotherapies that have had spectacular effects in many diseases, particularly melanoma. You've heard about Jimmy Carter, had a melanoma in his brain, got this wonderful new drug, the melanoma melted away. That's kind of science fiction, but it's the kind of thing that's happening when science comes to it, yet there's a cost. So some of that revving up of your immune system can attack other parts of your body. So we're getting databases to look at that. We are getting cardiologists to look at that. We are investing across the lifespan. We have pediatrics. We have AYA, uh, which is Adolescent and Young Adult Programs. We have geriatric oncology, so we're really mindful of the whole area. Workforce development, we do not have enough oncologists or oncology nurses or clinical trial people. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to train with the cancer center program across the state. We're particularly interested in, the, in diversity of our workforce, and we've started a biology of cancer course that's involving NC Central and NCANT and this year will actually go live across all of the state's HBCUs. So we want to train, train undergraduates, undergraduate nurses, about cancer, what it means, and how they could help in, in a, a career. We're doing the same thing across uh, you know, our wonderful community college. We have a course that's training the faculty at community colleges, again, with the idea that cancer and healthcare are a big part of the economy uh, and the community colleges, we want those um, you know, matriculants to be exposed and to be able to understand what cancer is about, not to be afraid of it, but to think about a career in that. Data is the lifeblood, and we have a database called Cypher, which has 750,000 the last 15 years of cancer cases in it. They're all linked to, linked to all kinds of claims data, Medicare, Medicaid, state employees, uh, and, um, you know, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. So we can look at an individual case in northeastern North Carolina for a patient that gets colon cancer, and we can see if they got a colonoscopy in the two or three years before. And the answer to that is not so much in that area. So that kind of data, collecting data from every cancer case, is helping us do what we call implementation science, okay? We've analyzed that. What can we do about that? We have research projects in Northeastern uh, um, you know, NC that are trying to increase the rate of screening for colon cancer, and we're about to start uh, you know, a funded project for increase uh, you know, in lung cancer screening. 
So these are the ways that we look at that. Here's the data. The data tells you, not surprisingly, that lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate, colon, and pancreas are the biggest killers in our state. But what is important to us is that we have real disparities. We have disparities that are black-white differences. Blacks in the state don't do as well in certain diseases. <clears throat> There's been a chronic two-fold difference in death rates in prostate cancer in this state, and we need to, we, we need to work on that. Endometrial cancer. Uh, those are all things that we're looking at, different reasons, health services, are there environmental issues in certain parts of the state. There's a rural urban divide. <clears throat> if you go back 15, 20 years ago, you actually did better if you were from a rural area than an urban area. It's now reversed. So we need to get health services out to our rural areas. We've invested in decades over these kind of projects that we call community-based participatory research, where we go out and get a group in the community to look at their problem, come up with their solution, and then try to activate that so that we can get early detection, prevention, diet, obesity. Those are the kind of things that we're working out in the community. <clears throat> I have a couple of examples that I call cool science. We say transdisciplinary, and what that means is you grab one from column A and one from column B and put them together. We have a biomedical engineering department here with state uh, that is uh, now led by Paul Dayton, and, um, you know, and Stephanie Montgomery is doing the pathology. And Paul has developed ways of taking microbubbles and putting oxygen in them and putting them in the mouse or the dog. We haven't done this in humans yet, but we're going to. If your tumor is starved for oxygen, which most tumors are because they're dense, it doesn't respond very well to radiation therapy. So what Paul is doing is putting oxygen in these microbubbles, taking an ultrasound, absolutely non-toxic, putting it over your pancreas and bursting those bubbles so the oxygen level goes up, and then you can respond to radiation therapy. So again, engineering, clinical care, early detection. We are all into data science. Here's a wonderful program where a couple of our faculty in computer science are, we're putting Alexas in the home of people that have been uh, operated on for bladder cancer. Bladder cancer is a disease mostly of the elderly. These are big operations. We send people home from the hospital, sometimes I think before they're ready to go, and we tell their family to be their nurse. Uh, what we're doing now is putting an Alexa in there that's feeding through a natural language processing and spitting out to our doctors and nurses there's something going on here that we need to look at. So again, computer science all the way to care and beyond. The physics and chemistry department are helping us develop new machines, uh, new machines that are able to give x-rays in a very different way that we think are going to be successful. And radio chemists who are tagging um, you know, radioactive metals on things that we can use to treat chemistry. So again, it's going across the spectrum. The key to really curing advanced cancer, we can do radiation oncology, we can do you know, radionucleides, and we could get rid of 95 to 98% of the tumor cells. The final common pathway has to be the immune system. The human immune system you educate your uh, immune system when you're a baby not to attack yourself. That makes sense. If, you, if your immune system goes awry, you get autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or colitis or things like that. Well, that's great for keeping us healthy. It's bad inside your tumor because your tumor is a little bit like self. Your immune system's coming in. There's an interplay which suppresses your immune system so it can't come in. 
What we are learning now is that we can rectify that with new drugs, with new ways of looking at it. And one of my favorites is something that we're doing called CAR-T therapy, and I'm going to end with this, I think. Um, we are taking patients who have been treated with six to seven regimens. They have nothing left. We take them, and we can take about 100 mLs of blood and isolate certain cells that are kind of stem cells from your T cell. And then we take them out uh, about a mile outside of town where we built a clean room manufacturing. And we can take those cells and grow them up to about 100 million T cells, the patient's T cells. And then we take a virus that's got a gene in it. Now this is a good use of a virus. And that gene, we transfect the person's T cells and give them a gene that recognizes their cancer. Because T cells are the killers. They can get rid of some things. Then we grow them up again to 10 billion of those T cells. All of this takes about three weeks. We go back. It's very undramatic. We take kind of a 10 cc syringe and give a billion T cells back to the patient. And literally within hours, those T cells start destroying the cancer. It is science fiction. It is remarkable. And we have trials that are working in hematologic malignancies, but we have the world's first, not the world's first, but the world's only open ovarian cancer trial of a CAR-T now. We will open glioblastoma, pancreatic cancer in the next year and triple negative breast cancer. This place has come together with remarkable investment, remarkable science. We all work together. The patients that we take care of cancer get infectious diseases. Uh, we work together as a team. It's an exciting time to be involved in this. Happy to answer any questions. So are there any questions that you have um, for Dr. Erb? Yeah, I've got Dr. Erb, I've got a question. Um, I, probably seven, eight years ago, Dr. Sharp was spoke at Roy Williams Cancer Breakfast. It was an annual event until the last couple of years. And he talked about <clears throat> the pharmacogenetic test that the patients, they would give the patients, they take the swab, take that from the patients, find out what drugs, their enzymes in their liver would and would not be effective against, and is that continuing? That, that seemed to be a huge thing when he spoke about it at, at the breakfast. No, thank you. Yeah, there are two aspects to that. One, the, that swab will determine the germ line, in other words, what the host brings to this. And there are certain enzymes that will metabolize our cancer drugs to make them ineffective. So you don't want to give those drugs to people. So that's a test that's kind of now in, in, in practice. The other thing that's maybe even more important is sequencing your tumor. So now we take a piece of your tumor and we do their various levels, but we generally sequence about 600 of your 18,000 genes which are known to drive cancer. And we get a, a readout of what your cancer is missing or what your cancer has too much of, and that can help us uh, determine which drugs. We have a molecular tumor board that meets every week that helps doctors analyze this data, but that's called precision medicine. Uh, it's still growing, uh, and we are actually sequencing more and more, and there, we're now learning that some of that sequence can tell us if you're going to respond to immunotherapy. Uh, so it's, it started off with, oh, if you have this mutation, you should get this drug. Now you can look and say, well, you have a lot of mutations. Maybe you can respond to immunotherapy. So it's very much a part of what we do every day. Another question. Uh, uh, I'm curious, have you had any success in cancers other than blood cancers for uh, T cell, CAR T cell 
technology. That's been the tougher nut to crack. That's why we're all we're all over it. Um, there have not been home runs uh, in what we call solid tumors. Um, solid tumors are, I talked about them being dense and hypoxic and, uh, you know, kind of a gamish that's hard to get T cells into. So we are, you know, literally opening new trials, first in human trials that have never been tried for anybody to see first if we find this piece that will target the cancer and not hit the rest of your body, okay? We have a really wonderful thing that we put, we actually put two genes into this because we don't know when you go first in the, into a human whether we're gonna do more harm than good. The second gene we put in is called a suicide gene and we've already used it now in four patients. You put this in, the tumor is getting destroyed, but something else bad is happening. We can now activate that second gene and destroy the CAR T cell and get the patient out of trouble. That's really important when we're going into these diseases that have never been treated. So a safety switch type of thing, is that what you're Yes, saying? yes. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, Can't hear you. Um, that's a very interesting uh, idea that you just expressed. Um, in the solid tumor in which you inject the CAR T cell tech, are you telling me you are having some luck with sol solid tumor t uh, trials, I guess, or whatever? We, we're doing great in certain solid tumors in mice. Uh, and we're taking that knowledge and moving it in, into humans now. We do not have... And they've almost been, and it, we're not the only places doing this. We are just about to, this is, program's been so successful that we're tripling it in size. We have, uh, we had a 6,000 square foot clean room facility. We'll be opening an 18,000 foot uh, clean room facility. It's the biggest in the Southeast in an academic center and one of the biggest. We're gonna be one of the three or four places in the world, but we're not there yet for solid tumors. We're, we're, we're doing extremely well with certain types of lymphomas and leukemias. So I have a, one general question. Um, you mentioned early that years ago we were all thinking and scared about getting cancer. Um, it seems like we have more and more ways to detect many types of cancer early, um, but now the fear has moved to what about the second recurrence, metast metastases. So does Leinberger or anyone think about metastases in a specific way uh, so that we can earlier diagnose that, diagnose the effectiveness of the treatments, or even think about different treatments for metastatic disease? So one of the things that we are uh, doing, along with many, many other people, uh, is uh, when you have a tumor, the tumor cells break up. I mean, they, they die all the time. Actually, normal cells die all the time. And they release circulating DNA in small amounts. Um, we're trying to look at circulating DNA for mutations. There's a gene called RAS, which is mutated in a certain way in 95% of pancreatic cancers, okay? Pancreatic cancers is uh, are one of the hardest to treat, very hard to detect early. So we're trying to perfect a, a blood test where we can look for circulating DNA that may be able to screen. That's gonna be a hard thing because you're screening you know, a million people uh, and, and trying to you know, you pick the needle out of the haystack. But once you have the tumor and we've already sequenced it, we know the mutational profile. So then it's easy to, not easy, but it's technically feasible to sample and look for early recurrence. And early recurrence, of course, is gonna be easier to treat than multiple. But when people have widespread metastasis, there's only one answer, and that's the immune system. And so that's what we're working on. So that when we talk about the success of the CAR-T program, all of those people have widespread 
cancer, and we've had successes. We need more successes. The, the T cell can move all around the body. It can go into the bone. It can go into the pancreas. It can go into the ovaries or other places. And so one of the reasons we're so excited about that kind of cell therapy is the therapy's mobile. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question that would oh, combine. I'm sorry, both. somebody, this gentleman's been waiting. Who's been? Oh, I'm sorry, that was you. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Just a question to combine both of your wisdom. Um, we know vaccines work. We can eradicate cervical cancer. We get our vaccination rates up to 80%. And of course, the whole COVID thing, as a physician who's practiced 40 years, it's driving me nuts. The, ba the barriers we have to getting vaccinations. What are you guys doing for this? And what do you think the future is going to be if people aren't going to take vaccines? Uh, my wife, who's with me today, is Joanne Earp, and she's the retired chair of health behavior. Um, and she is, has always said that this stuff that we do in basic science is, isn't going to work unless we can change behavior. Uh, so we have people working on that. Uh, we actually have a group that just got a very big grant from NCI about HPV vaccination for young girls, which is the uptake. This is a a vaccine that can prevent not only young girls and as they age from getting cervical cancer, but anal cancer and head and neck cancer in boys and girls. So what's the message to get that out? And it's, it's really behavior. Uh, unfortunately, it's gotten politicized. Um, so we're gonna have to figure that out too. Okay, do we have time for one more question? One more. Um, I'm Gwen Waddell, Schultz in class of 70. I have a question, Dr. Cohen. What's the recommendation for uh, those who got the J&J &J now uh, and what they should do? And how do you spell the ever shelf? How do you spell that? Uh, okay, two things. The first thing is for J&J, &J, if you got J&J, &J, we would definitely now repeat vaccinations at a certain number of vaccines with Moderna or Pfizer. So, and then in the near future, there'll be another vaccine called Novavax, which is a protein vaccine. But right now, there'd be no doubt if you've if you had one dose of J&J, &J, you would receive several doses of either Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. That, that's the first thing. Evyasheld is, is a, it's called AZD. It's made by AstraZeneca. It's, it's a combination of monoclonal antibodies together as a cocktail, given two shots, one in each arm. Um, and, um, you know, it, but, and we will have other drugs. This is the first of these drugs, okay? So I'm talking about Evusheld today, E-V-U-S-H-E-L-D, but there's gonna be others in another couple of months. Other, others will surface. Uh, this has been in short supply. I was talking to my friend, Dr. Erp, about this before. The short supply has led the oncologist to restrict it more to people who have very clear deficiencies in their B cells, okay? But the problem we have is when we look across the population that gets vaccinated, we don't know who had a good vaccine take and who did not. And when, when my friend was saying, well, somebody in the family got COVID even in spite of the vaccines, it could be because they didn't have a good take. And, and as you get older with underlying diseases, your take may not be as good. So in the future, we'll figure all this out better. We're building an airplane while we're flying it. I mean, he's had, he's had a lifetime to work on cancer. We've had 20 months to work on COVID. So I think we're doing pretty good, actually. <laughs> well, I, I think we all appreciate these gentlemen's time, and let's give them a big round of applause.